Dear congregation, you recall that some weeks ago we began a new series of sermons called Cultivating Biblical Godly Relationships. We looked at uh, one message on the relationship between parents and children, and then we looked at a, a message on the developing of godly friendships among the people of God. Now, there are many things, of course, to, to consider when it comes to relationships, and it's my desire now to, to move to the foundational relationship between you and God, and we want to look at that through the lens of Psalm 23, and then, God willing, this will carry us through at least the rest of this year, and then we hope to come back to looking at things like you and your spouse, more sermons on you and your children, and so on, God willing, next year. But we want to get the vertical relationship established rightly, and then move to the horizontal. Now, when I first came here some 29 years ago, 28, 9 years ago, we looked at Psalm 23 in an extended series in the afternoon messages, which very few of you heard. But I've reworked that material extensively, and I'm coming now to you with a shorter series of sermons, and uh, hopefully one that you will enjoy and benefit from. Scripture abounds with the metaphor of the shepherd-sheep relationship. Actually, the Bible speaks of sheep 176 times, of lambs 164 times, and of shepherds 80 times. But no shepherd-sheep imagery is so vivid as that of Psalm 23. Though three millennia have passed, still the sweet singer of Israel who first sang about this wonderful shepherding care of God in this most famous psalm ever written, proclaims in it profound truths, invaluable lessons, and provides us with spiritual depth. This is a glorious psalm that summarizes the beautiful relationship between the great shepherd, the Lord Jesus, and his needy sheep. Psalm 23 is a deeply spiritual meditation, a jewel unsurpassed in richness and beauty, which is exactly why it's dangerous. Because so many people, and we can be guilty of it too, take it on our lips so lightly. Nearly every funeral you go to, you open it up, and there's Psalm 23 on the left side of the memory folder. Everyone takes it onto their lips. Everyone thinks they possess it. But so few understand the profundity of this psalm. And far too many self-proclaimed but self-deceived Christians have abused its words to such an extent that no separation is made anymore between the natural and the spiritual, between common and saving grace, or between sheep and goats. But even people of God can take this rich psalm for granted when we lack the application of the Holy Spirit, the sublime truths embedded in the psalm can remain hidden for us. But when it's applied by the Holy Spirit, Psalm 23 reveals the highest and deepest and widest and most glorious experiences into which God can lead his people on this side of heaven. And so for the children of God, Psalm 23 is really three glorious things. First of all, it's a pilgrim song. As we journey through the vanity fair of this world, oppressed by enemies outside of us and within us, we look to Psalm 23 for courage. How many times a psalm has been a balm to so soldiers wounded on the battlefield of free grace? It's a key to unlock the chains of spiritual prisoners. It's been honey to brighten the eyes of weary saints. Charles Spurgeon said of this psalm, I'll venture to compare it to the lark, which sings as it mounts and mounts as it sings till it is out of sight 
and even then not out of hearing. For these are celestial notes more fitted for the eternal mansions than for those dwelling below the clouds. It's a pilgrim song. But secondly, it's a personal creed. It's a personal creed. Someone once wrote, before they died, Psalm 23 is my creed. I need, I desire no other. I learned it from my mother's lips. I've repeated it every morning all my life, yet I do not half understand it. I'm only beginning to spell out its infinite meaning, and death will come upon me with a task unfinished. But by the grace of Jesus, I'll hold on to this psalm as my creed and will strive to believe it and to live it, for I know it will lead me to the cross and it will guide me to glory. This is a personal creed of victory for the people of God. And then thirdly, from this psalm, we experience profound communion, profound communion with God. When we are led into this psalm by the Holy Spirit, it will become a holy of holies for us. Through this psalm, believers commune with the God the Father, find reconciliation through the blood of the redeeming shepherd, and receive the Spirit's grace to rest in the triune God. This psalm is holy ground, a spiritual oasis in the desert, a refuge in all the storms of life, a rock of safety and blessedness. So as we seek to expound this psalm today and in coming sermons, we pray that for you and for me, it will be really a pilgrim song, a personal creed, and a holy of holies. So we turn to the first words of the psalm then this morning, simply these, Psalm 23, 1a, the Lord is my shepherd. We'll look at the shepherd-sheep relationship generically this morning, the shepherd purchasing his sheep, owning his sheep, preserving his sheep. Purchasing, owning, preserving his sheep. Centuries ago, a Persian ruler dedicated one room of his palace to the memory of his early days as a shepherd boy. The bare floors housed nothing but the simple equipment of shepherding, a staff, a rod, a knapsack, a water jug. In a few minutes every day, this Persian ruler would go and sit in that room just to remind himself of what he had once been. It served as a warning against the temptations of royal power and popular favor. And so similarly, David, the king, surrounded with power and riches and honor and temptations, did not forget his days as a shepherd boy. Enlightened by the Holy Spirit, he wrote Psalm 23, blending, folding into it his mature experience as an aging believer with memories of his humble beginnings as a shepherd boy when he received his first spiritual lessons. David's autograph is written across every verse of this psalm. Every verse reveals its author is one who suffered deeply, who tasted the cup of bitterness, who had continually disappointed himself but was not disappointed in his God. Every verse speaks of rest and revival. David's faith here as he writes the psalm under the Spirit's inspiration is alive. His love is fiery. His hope is firm. He looks to the shepherd. He finds everything in the great shepherd, the Messiah, to come. And he looks back in this psalm on all the storms he's been through, the warfare, the rebellion, the sin, the sorrow. He sees the green valleys, the gentle streams into which God has led him. John Calvin says of this psalm, David is calling to remembrance the benefits God conferred upon him. And those benefits are like ladders by which he may ascend nearer and nearer to his God. Yes, from a shepherd boy 
to the aged Saint King. David embeds his experience in these six short verses. And it all begins with this. The Lord is my shepherd. What a glorious thing. David begins this psalm with the Lord. He continues this psalm with the Lord. He ends this psalm in the Lord. The words, the Lord, with the capital letters, are the foundation of Psalm 23, as well as the entire life of God's people. May I ask you this morning, as we try to begin to unpack these profound opening words, are these words, the Lord, the foundation of your life as well? Have you been stripped of all your righteousness to find all your hope in the Lord? Do you understand what John means when he says this is life eternal to know God and Jesus Christ, his son, whom he has sent? Is the Lord everything to you? Have you met him? Have you you met him in his glorious attributes? Have you met him in the face of his son? Do you know his holiness, his love, his majesty, his grace, his mercy? Is this your foundation for eternity, the Lord? You see, without a saving knowledge of God in Christ, we cannot walk the journey of Psalm 23 in truth because we're really on the road to destruction, aren't we? Regardless of any wisdom or power or riches to to which we we have attained. Jeremiah said rightly, Thus saith the Lord, let not the wise man glory in his wisdom or the mighty man in his might or the rich man in his riches but let him that glorieth glory in this that he understandeth and knoweth me that I am the Lord this is what life is all about the opening two words of this psalm in the beginning God the Bible begins and Psalm 23 begins the Lord and of course by nature we're without we're without the Lord in the world And because of our deep fall, we're no longer the sheep of our creator. We're called wolves and lions and adders and wild beasts in the Bible. We're the property of the devil, really. By nature, we follow Satan, who's a miserable shepherd, who looks out only for himself, who deceives his sheep, tricks them for his own greedy satisfaction. And young people, you follow Satan... May I just say to you this, he promises much, but his flock is thin and weak and riddled with diseases and parasites, and his pasture is dry and barren, his fold is broken down, he doesn't care about his flock, he actually hates his sheep, and his hatred is motivated by his hatred for the shepherd of the people of God. If he were a shepherd among earthly shepherds, he would be despised. But the problem when we're not saved, whether we're children or young people or old people, as his sheep, we know no better than to follow him. We're blind to our own misery. We've never known a better life. We've never known the profound joy of knowing the Lord in Jesus Christ. Once you taste the Lord is my shepherd, you will never, never want to go back to satanic shepherding. The dry, empty grass of the world is the constant diet of those who follow Satan. That's why you've memorized, young people, uh, Abraham Hellenbrook's question uh, for many years. With the exception of Satan, there is not a more miserable creature than natural man. You see, as sheep blindly follow one another into places that eventually destroy them, so we blindly by nature follow Satan, allowing him to guide us straight into hell. But David can say, by grace, and oh, amazing grace, the Lord is my shepherd. Yes, these are capital letters. That means the word Yahweh, or sometimes spelled out Jehovah, given the vowels. 
Nearly 7,000 times in Scripture, this Yahweh, Jehovah, the Lord, with caps, is used. The Lord calls himself by this special name. This is the name we just read about this morning in the law. Don't take the name of the Lord in vain. It's a special name, which means I am that I am, the I was that I was, the I shall be that I shall be, the unchangeable, covenant-keeping God. That's the meaning. Who's ever the same, the self-existent one, the unchangeable one who establishes, keeps covenant from eternity to eternity, the one who's in the burning bush but's never consumed, the one who inhabits eternity and yet dwells between the cherubim. He, the triune God, says David, is my shepherd. So David's shepherd is God the Father who sovereignly chooses his flock from eternity. It's God the Spirit, Holy Spirit, who brings all in that flock, in the time and hour of his sovereign good pleasure. But especially, David's shepherd is God, the Son, the Messiah, the Lord Jesus, the wonderful shepherd, the sheep. Now, when the Bible speaks about Jesus as shepherd, it uses three adjectives. He's often called the good shepherd who gives his life for his sheep. John 10, 11. But he's also called the great shepherd. The great shepherd of the sheep brought again from the dead through whom God works his holy sanctifying will in his people. Hebrews 13. And then we find him called the chief shepherd. 1 Peter 5, verse 4 and other places. With reference to his second advent, he's coming again to gather his sheep to himself as a crown of glory that fades not away. Now that good, great, and chief shepherd paradigm is actually what you find in Psalms 22, 23, and 24. In Psalm 22, we find the good shepherd laying down his life for his sheep, crying out, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? In Psalm 23, we find him as the great shepherd who's exalted, as it were, and sanctifying his sheep to walk in his ways. And in Psalm 24, we find the gates being lifted up and the chief shepherd coming through, gathering his flock back to himself. What a glorious shepherd we have. As the good shepherd, he's the shepherd redeemer who on Calvary's cross laid down his life, purchasing us from the fold of Satan with the full approval of God. As the great shepherd, he's the shepherd owner who names us and marks us and possesses us and leads us. And as the shepherd keeper, preserver, he gathers and defends and preserves us from the right hand of the Father and brings us home to be with him forever in the Father's house. Is this good, great chief shepherd your shepherd today? Do you belong to him? Do you love him? And if you dare not claim him by possession, can you claim him by desire? Can you say he's drawn you to the point where you cannot live without him? Oh, what a shepherd the Lord is. We need him in all three capacities. We need him in the first place then as our purchaser, as our sheep redeemer. You see, sheep are unique creatures. They badly need a shepherd. They need a shepherd to own them, possess them, purchase them, redeem them, take care of them. Why? Well, let me just give you four quick qualities of sheep. We'll look at more qualities in future sermons, but the basic qualities of sheep are these. Number one, a sheep is dependent. <coughs> Left alone, a sheep will soon perish. It needs assistance in every aspect of life. Can't provide its own food. Has no means to defend itself from, from enemies or injuries. Can't take care of itself when it's injured. It needs guidance, protection, day and night. Without a shepherd, sheep won't last long. And yet by nature, you see, when we've come out of paradise in Adam, 
our great goal is independency. We think, we think we can do it on our own. We think we're invulnerable. It's the Holy Spirit who has to come and teach us how, how dependent we are upon the good shepherd. Without him, we can do nothing, the Bible says. Secondly, a sheep is foolish. Sheep will habitually leave rich pastures to go to barren ones. They know how to get lost, but not how to find their way home again. Left to themselves, sheep wouldn't know what pasture should be fed upon during the summer, nor where to retire in the winter. So foolish was I and ignorant, said Asaph, that I was as a beast before thee. Have you ever realized your own foolishness and needed the wisdom of the great shepherd? And thirdly, a sheep is prone to wander. It will go anywhere except in the direction it should be going. A wandering flock is a picture of God's erring people of whom God himself complained in Hosea. My people are prone, bent, what a powerful word, bent to backsliding from me. Isaiah said, all we like sheep have gone astray. You see, when God teaches us who we are, we, we say, Lord, from my side, I'm, I'm just a backslider. I, I, I tend to go the wrong way again and again. I'm, I'm like a wandering sheep. David said that in the very last verse of Psalm 119. After all the teaching he had from the word of God, he said, I'm a, I'm a wandering sheep. And finally, fourthly, sheep are stubborn, very stubborn. When a shepherd attempts to wash his sheep, the animal will fight it. It will struggle to be freed as long as there's ground beneath its feet. It's only when the shepherd knocks, knocks its feet away from beneath, causing a shepherd to lose its foothold and float in the bathwater that the stubborn animal will finally give up the battle and submit to the washing. What a lesson we have to learn here. We need to lose our own foothold, learn to surrender as a dependent, foolish, wandering, stubborn sheep. We need to be swept off our own legs, as it were. We need to have our own self-strength and self-righteousness destroyed. We need the Redeemer, Shepherd, to come and purchase us from eternity, to come and suffer and die for us and pay for our sins and obey the law for us and satisfy the justice of God for us and remove the curse of sin for us. And so Gethsemane, in the garden, at Gabbatha, in the judgment hall of Pilate, at Golgotha, on the cross, you find the Savior silent, don't you? Not responding to accusers. Why? Because he's taking the place of the guilty. He's purchasing as your substitute, your child of God, your soul, so that he has a right, a just right, to be your Savior, to be your shepherd. He goes all the way to Calvary to pay the full price of your redemption. He hangs naked in the flame of his Father's wrath, forsaken of heaven and earth and hell. He trods the winepress alone in the darkness when even in nature the sun won't shine upon him to pay for your sin, dear believer, so he can be your redeemer, purchaser, your shepherd who could buy you to own you so that you could be his own and so that you could say, this is my only comfort in life and death that I don't belong to myself but to my faithful shepherd, the Lord Jesus Christ. But then he doesn't only purchase you, he also owns you. He owns you. It's a fascinating thing. But what shepherds do is they mark their sheep and they own their sheep by naming them as well. Marking and naming. Those are the two parts of tangible ownership. And these are beautiful things. Now in Bible times, sheep marking was a painful process. Uh, the shepherd would have to catch each animal, young animal in turn, 
have to lay its ear on a wooden block and notch it deeply according to the unique shape of his own earmark using the razor sharp edge of his knife. And that whole process was actually painful for both the shepherd and the sheep. Yet through this indelible mark of ownership, a relationship was established. And a neighboring shepherd farmer could, could distinguish from that earmark, even from some distance, to which farmer that sheep belonged. Now, a parallel to sheep marking is how a slave in the Old Testament desired to remain a lifetime member of his master's home. You remember how he was marked? He had to go to the gate. His master took uh, the slave there, put his earlobe against the doorpost, and with an awl, he bored a hole through his ear. And he publicly declared, I love my master, my master's family, my master's service. I want to remain his willing slave forever. It was a sign of ownership. And you see, that's what Jesus promised to do. When he came to purchase his sheep, it wasn't just to purchase them and turn them over to his father, but it was to purchase them, to own them, to mark them, to name them, to call them his own. Lo, I come to do thy will, O my God. Jesus himself is the great willing servant of the Father who is willing to have his, his ear pierced, Psalm 40 says, so that he can justly be the owner. He bore the bloody marks of Calvary's cross with his pain so that he can mark his sheep and have them follow him. And so sometimes scholars call this the blood mark of the covenant. This covenant mark is not painless jewelry worn about the neck, but a painful mark on a believer's heart. It's described this way in Matthew 16. If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Every true sheep will follow its own shepherd. I had the privilege once of doing a communion season with Jeff Thomas in, in the island of Lewis in Scotland. And uh, we stayed in a minister's house where there were sheep grazing all over the yard. And, and today they don't really notch their ears, but they, they put a certain paint color on their shoulder. And that identifies a sheep. And I looked around and I saw all these sheep with brown marks on their shoulders, some with blue, and there were some with green, and there were some with red. I saw four different colors. And I said to, to the pastor, I said, does that mean that there's four different shepherds that have these sheep? And he said, yes. All the red sheep, Red mark sheep belong to a certain shepherd and all the brown and so on. And I said, now is it really true? I mean, is it really true that when a shepherd comes along and he calls his sheep, let's say he owns all the red mark sheep, that all the red mark sheep will go running to him right away and all the other sheep will just keep on grazing without doing anything. He said, it's actually totally true. I wish I had seen it. I didn't say it, but... But you see, that's what happens. When Jesus Christ becomes our shepherd, we, we get marked, we get branded, that we belong to him. We become a Christian, which really means a little Christ, a follower of Christ. And we were made willing in the day of his power to follow him. Now, it doesn't mean we don't sin. doesn't mean we don't wander. No, we have all those terrible qualities of sheep. But, but there's a relationship established with our shepherd. And this is our desire to deny ourselves every day, to take up the cross every day, to follow Jesus every day, because we, by grace, belong to him. And we realize in the depths of our soul, you see, no man, Matthew 6, can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. And so to be earmarked by Jesus, to be identified by Jesus, is actually a blessing for his sheep. So that we get distinguished. So that other sheep and shepherds, other shepherds, can recognize even from afar, that's a Christian. 
That's a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord is my shepherd. That personalness gives me security, knowing that I'm marked by him. I'm set apart by him. I belong to him. What a joy. Even though it involves self-denial, even though it involves paying the price of, 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 of surrendering everything to him, it involves the price of, 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 of living out of the paradigm that nothing belongs to me but all belongs to him. It is a sweet surrender, a sweet servanthood. The Lord is my shepherd. It's a blessing to belong to Jesus Christ. But then also, a shepherd owns his flock by naming them. You see, sheep marking symbolize public distinction and security. It's an element of security for sheep to know he belongs to the shepherd. If he wanders too far, someone can see it, or the shepherd himself will see it, and, 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 and the sheep will be brought back. But there's also an act of naming Every good ancient shepherd had a particular name of intimacy for every sheep he owned. And the sheep would not only respond to the shepherd's call to the flock as a whole, but the shepherd could also call out that particular name of an individual sheep that was so intimate that the sheep would respond. And if a strange shepherd called out that name, that certain name of that certain sheep, the sheep would not respond. He does not hear a stranger's voice. What a beautiful picture this is of the eternal secret between the chief shepherd and his sheep for one day, when we come to glory, dear children of God, Jesus will confirm as our chief shepherd that he will give us a white stone and in the stone and a new name written, which no man knoweth, saving he that receiveth it. And so this shepherd owns us, owns us from his father's eternal decree in eternity past, confirms it in time when we're born again, and preserves us to the end so that he will take possession of us to himself that we may be with him where he is forever and ever in the eternal glory to come. This is really the heart of the blessed eternal covenant of grace. I will be their God and they shall be my people. We become the shepherd's property, and he becomes our property. I mentioned Hellenbrook a little while ago, but Hellenbrook has another, Reverend Hellenbrook has another very good question when he says, what is the covenant of grace? And the answer is something like this. The covenant of grace is the way by which a sinner becomes the property of God, and God becomes the property of the sinner. This is a shepherd-sheep relationship. He doesn't only own me, but I, by grace, possess him. He is mine, and I am his. My Lord and my God, said Thomas. It's a two-way exchange of ownership. And so Jesus can say, my sheep hear my voice. I know them. They follow me. I give to them eternal life and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. Because he's not only the purchaser and the owner, but he's also the preserver. That we'll look at in our third thought after we sing. Psalter 52, 52. Thou, Jehovah, art my shepherd. Psalm 23, 52. <laughs>
A good shepherd is always with his sheep, 24-7, even at nighttime, when they embed himself, they embed themselves in his fold, he's, he's at their gate, he lays down the door of the fold. He, there's nothing you see that concerns his charges of his sheep that he doesn't care for. He's with them in all seasons, in rain, in winter, in summer. With sound judgment and discretion, he exercises his authority over them. He watches out for their safety. He leads them to the best pastures. He protects them against every danger. He searches after wanderers from the full. He cleanses the defile. He administers medicine to the diseased. He won't allow any sheep to become entangled in a thicket. He won't allow a sheep to be swept away by overflowing waters. He holds the wounded. He patiently bears with the weak. He watches over the young, the weak, but also day and night he provides food for his flock, a fold for their safety. All of this is a type of the Lord Jesus Christ, who's the great shepherd, who right now is at the right hand of the Father, ever living to make intercession for his sheep, guiding, preserving, leading, keeping, by faith, his sheep for the final day. So how does a shepherd do all this? Well, he's got 10 wonderful qualities. I just want to give them to you very, very quickly. We'll be enlarging more in some of these. Number one, he has a shepherd's heart, a shepherd's heart. It beats with pure, overflowing, unconditional love toward his chosen flock, his purchased flock, his owned flock. Second, he has a shepherd's hand that rules and guides and directs his sheep, steering them away from sin and Satan and the world and selfishness and false doctrine. Third, he has a shepherd's eye. It takes within its scope his entire flock. Even those that are wandering far from the path, he can see them. Fourth, he has a shepherd's ear, which responds to the bleating cry of one sheep, as if there were no other sheep in all the flock. Five, he has a shepherd's nearness. He remains beside his flock with majesty and grace. He never sleeps. He never slumbers. Six, he has a shepherd's knowledge. He knows his flock. He knows them internally and externally. He knows them better than they know themselves. He's minutely acquainted with all their weaknesses, infirmities, diseases, past history, sorrows, joys. He meets their needs with shepherding wisdom. Seven, he has a shepherd's skill. He leads his sheep to pastures suitable to their individual circumstances and characters. He knows how to give the right medicine, the right dosage to the sick, to furnish the morning with comfort, to bolster the weak with strength. And eighth, he has a shepherd's experience. When a Welsh shepherd was once asked how long it took a shepherd to become competent, he replied, about four generations. You see, Jesus Christ is not a novice shepherd. From eternity past, through all of time, he's shown divine wisdom and power and ability in sheep management. He's an expert shepherd of 6,000 years of experience. Number nine, he exercises a shepherd's faithfulness. Faithfulness. Jesus Christ is no hireling. He doesn't run away when danger comes. He doesn't leave or forsake his flock. During the day, he stands beside them fighting off the adversaries. At night, he's the door of the fold behind which they find protection. He says, not one of my sheep shall be lost. What a comfort. What a comfort. And finally, number 10, he has both a shepherd's strength and a shepherd's tenderness at the same time. 
I once read a study of what, what women are looking for in their husbands, and, and the conclusion of the study was they want a man who's strong and tender at the same time. Well, this is what the sheep of God want. They want a strong shepherd who's tender. And with his shepherd's rod, you see, he disciplines his beloved sheep. He guides them in the right path. He's strong. He's firm. He delivers them from the jaw of the lion, the paw of the bear, the teeth of the wolf. But he's also tender. He won't overdrive his flock. No lamb is too small for him to carry in his bosom. No sheep too weak for him to guide with gentle strength. None so faint that he cannot give it rest. He pities his sheep as a father and comforts them as a mother. The Lord is my shepherd. This is your shepherd, child of God. Love him. Serve him. He redeems you. He's bought you. He purchases you. He owns you. He marks you. He names you. And he will preserve you and keep you and defend you and guide you to the end. He's God, Lord over all, blessed forever, the self-existing, uncreated, eternal God, the one who holds the universes in his hand. This shepherd is your shepherd, your personal shepherd. This is the wonder of the gospel, the omniscient God, the strong God, the sin-hating God, the tender, merciful God, the unequaled God, unequaled in resources, unequaled in, in personality, unequaled in, in glory, the unbounded God is your shepherd. He will take care of you every step of the way. He'll forgive your sin. He'll wash you clean. He'll purify you. He'll bring you back from backsliding ways. He'll nurture you. He'll make you a follower of himself. He'll turn you into Christians so that you follow him whithersoever he will lead you. He will care for you in every evil, every danger, every enemy. What need is there that he cannot meet? He knows how to relate to four-year-old boys and girls. He knows how to relate to 95-year-old seniors. He knows how to relate to people of different dispositions and characters and temptations. Doesn't matter your language, your country, your ethnicity. The eye of this shepherd Lord observes each of his dispersed sheep as if they're all gathered before him in one place. He hears their requests individually. His hand administers blessings to each sheep according to your own need at the moment. He's never impatient to the troubled heart. He imparts peace to the weary, rest, to the penitent, pardon, to the hungry, food, to the blind, sight. To the sick, he gives health, to the weak, strength, to the tempted, deliverance, to the foolish, wisdom, to the guilty, pardon, to the proud, humility, to the censorious, charity, to the bereaved, submission. To the living, he administers undying hope. To the dying, he promises endless life. Why wouldn't you want this shepherd? He's shepherd par excellence. Satan is a shepherd that never gives what he promises. This shepherd always gives more than he promises. He does exceeding, abundantly above all that we could ask or think. What a shepherd! Will you bend the knee to this shepherd? Has he purchased you? Is he your keeper? Does he have the keys to your heart even this morning? Do you know him? Do you listen to his voice? Do you love him? Do you trust him? Do you seek grace to follow him? Do you know the inward joy of bowing under his loving authority, acknowledging his wise ownership, do you find freedom in being his willing servant? Do you have a confidence in him that all things work together for good to them that love God? Does this shepherd mean everything to you? Can you say this morning, I haven't been the kind of sheep I know I need to be. I've, I've been such a sinner. I've been such a backslider, such a wanderer, so foolish, so... Oh, those four qualities of sheep, that's me, that's me. 
But my shepherd, I have nothing bad to say of my shepherd. My shepherd has been good to me. He's been faithful to me. He's purchased me. He owns me. He preserves me. He will keep me to the end. My trust is there. My hope is there. Oh, shepherd of the sheep, great, good chief shepherd, continue to shepherd me. Don't give up on me. Trust the shepherd. He's the shepherd of the weak and helpless. Love him with all your heart and soul and mind and strength. He will help you through. And so let it be your prayer. Lord, as feeble as I am, as defenseless as I am, be thou my shepherd. Art thou not almighty God? And if I'm weak, but thou art the strong one and thou art my shepherd, I am safe, Lord, help me. Let thy fullness supply me. Thy wisdom direct me. Let thy power protect me. Let thy right hand uphold me. Cause me to cry out in adoration. The Lord is my shepherd. And to those of you this morning who cannot say this yet, May I just close the sermon by saying, this shepherd is willing to be your shepherd. Boys and girls, he's baptized you. He's put his name on your forehead in the waters of baptism. Come to him just as you are and say, I'm a sinner. I'm just nothing but a sinner. I'm just like a sheep. But be thou a shepherd, my shepherd to this sheep because Lord Jesus I can't shepherd myself and you know what he's never turned away a single poor bleeding sheep who's come to him for help and mercy and salvation any sheep who comes and says, Lord, I can't do it. I'm a wanderer. I'm a sinner. I'm a backslider. Be thou my shepherd. He says, yes, I will be your shepherd forever. Trust him. Cast yourself upon him. And if you say, I can't do that, trust him to give you the grace to do that. He is the Savior of whom Scripture says that He gives repentance and forgiveness of sins to those who ask Him. Ask, and you shall receive. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and the shepherd will open the door. And don't rest until you too can say, the Lord, the Lord is my shepherd. Amen. Great God of heaven, what a shepherd thou art. We thank thee for thy amazing purchasing grace, thy amazing ownership taking charge, marking, naming us, and thy amazing preserving us all the way to the end, never disowning us, preserving despite our wandering character, despite our falling into sin, despite all the things that testify against us. Oh, God, we thank thee for thy amazing grace. And may these words ring in our ears and echo in our hearts all week long. The Lord is my shepherd. Precious, eternal is. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.